to begin with, uh, I just need to clarify that what I'm going to talk about is uh, a call for an article that I wrote with a colleague in German law school, uh, Dr. Eva Don, who was initially invited. She couldn't make it, so if I feel like a cheap substitute, it's because I am one. <laughs> so, actually, two or three weeks ago, we were again with Gabriel mm -hmm. and John uh, discussing the TIP in uh, Brighton, and we were having a discussion with John about how TTIP is not an issue in Greece. No, I, I'm Greek. No one cares about TTIP in Greece. And we were saying that, you know, TTIP is kind of middle class Germans worrying about GMOs kind of thing. It's not uh, poor people and poor people's problem. And now I'm going to contradict myself because I'm going to say that it is poor people's uh, problem, uh, mainly discussing the potential impact both of TTIP and of other so-called mega regionals, such as the EU, uh, Canada, the so-called CETA agreement, but also the TPP uh, agreement between the US and a number of other states, to those states excluded from these agreements. And I'm going to go back to what Robert House was discussing this morning, which is, it is a fairly common starting point to link the rise of these so-called mega regionals, including TTIP, to the failure, or at least to the, if you are optimistic, to the stalemate of the Doha development round as part of the WTO. So what happened there is that there, were, there was a number of disagreements between developing and developed states, or much more accurately probably between developing states and developed states elites about what sector should and should not be uh, liberalized further, and this seemed to be uh, coming to pretty much a stalemate. Without being taken as a defense of the WTO, and that's the last thing I ever intend to do uh, in this <laughs> life, uh, one characteristic of the WTO is that it operates on a model which is one state, one vote, which is in order to get further liberalization or, some, like in an imaginary world, further regulation, even though that was never going to happen, you need to have developing states on board, at least to an extent. And again, I'm not claiming that these developing states represent in any sensible way necessarily their peoples and necessarily the most disadvantaged and marginalized of their peoples, but still within the WTO, at least theoretically, they were uh, getting a voice, which seemed not to be particularly uh, welcome by uh, a number of developed states, and hence partly the shift uh, towards mega regionals. And if, if you follow the um, discourse of a number of like trade commissioners, like the U.S. Trade Representative for Trade, etc., you can see a discourse about you know there the want to do countries and the can do countries. And if the want to do countries don't want to continue with liberalization, obviously what is taken for granted here is that more liberalization is the only uh, way to go, the can-do countries will continue uh, on their own. And a point that we need to have in mind, I think, is that institutional shifts are not an unprecedented move when the global north is trying to carve the resistance of the global south. And for a very typical example, my, many of you might have heard of it, is in the 1970s, the recently decolonized states attempted a comprehensive reform of the international economic order. It's the so-called new international economic order. And one of the things that happened on an institutional level in the attempt of developed states to pretty much shut down this effort was to shift economic decision-making from the UN and the UN Conference on Trade and Development, where post-colonial states had a numerical majority, to the international financial institutions such as the World Bank and the IMF, where, as you may know, voting um, is quoted, it's weighted, and it follows the contribution of states. And for example, the IMF, it's impossible to have a decision if you don't have the US on board. So institutional shifts is a very well-established practice of the global north in order to resist demands of the global south. And again, here I'm putting this massive asterisk, which is I'm not necessarily saying that what developing states were pursuing in the Doha development round was necessarily a good thing. 
but it is what it is. And so he was mentioning the beginning in, uh, in the morning session again a thing by Robert House that if there is a degree of regulatory cooperation that excludes uh, or at least indirectly causes trade diversion, that could be challenged in the WTO and there's big chances of finding um, incompatibilities between such regimes and the WTO. I think this might or might not be true, but there are two answers. First is that before it's challenged and before a discussion, uh, a decision is ruled and before this decision is implemented, these regulations will be operative and they will have real trade diversion effects for states of the global south. So if a regulation is agreed, through the process, Gabriel decided, and this is a regulation, not necessarily a high regulation, but a different regulation to the regulation states of the Global South are using. This means that the trade between Global South and the Global North will become more expensive. Trade will be diverted because what is free trade agreement, or quote unquote free trade agreement for some states, it's trade diversion for some other states. And even if supposedly that was to go to the WTO, and there's a second asterisk there, which is, it seems that the US is less and less willing to play ball in the WTO for a number of reasons. So we need to see to what extent WTO will maintain the importance it has now for, the global, for global trade. But even if it is to go, this has real implications for states of the global south. And when we're discussing states of the global south, we also need to keep in mind that we're discussing states with very fragile economies to the extent that if there is trade diversion, even for a limited period of time, I'm not sure Liberia, for example, a post-Embola, post-civil uh, uh, conflict country will be able to deal effectively even with an intermediary period. And it's very interesting that in those few um, uh, academic especially research, and other research papers that deal with the issue of the global south, the arguments are, and they're supporting TTIP, TTIP, etc. They're saying, oh, they will not, it will not have big implications for the global south, but there are always two assumptions there. They're either implicit or explicit, depending on how polite uh, the authors are. The first is that the states of the global south will always be underdeveloped and will always be only exporting or predominantly exporting raw materials, and therefore, if there are things happening in industrialized goods, that is none of their concern, which is a big assumption and a problematic assumption, uh, presumably. And the second is that it will not be a problem because at the end of the day, they will end up adopting whatever regulation we might think is good to adopt, which obviously shows, I think, quite clearly a revival not that it ever went away, but a very clear revival of the idea that there are specific states that should determine uh, the, the conditions of global states, and there are states that, you know, they're rule takers, they will do whatever we tell them to do, which, by the way, might be fairly realistic, unfortunately, when it comes to sub-Saharan African states, but it might be less realistic and actually quite dangerous when it comes to China. So this idea that TPP, for example, to a big extent has to do with Obama's turn uh, to, the, to the Pacific and that it is a way to encircle China and make China do whatever the US thinks is fitted, it might work, but and we might have all sorts of objections anyway, but it might not. And China is also pursuing its, or its own regional uh, trade agreement, which, and I mean, the whole idea of the world breaking down into uh, trade blocks might not be the best stabilization uh, effort. And again, I'm not saying any of that. I'm not saying any of that to defend the WTO and to say that any sort of universal framework of trade is necessarily a good one. I'm just saying that, the, that this confidence the Global North seems to have might be right but problematically uh, but politically problematic when it comes to certain states, but when it comes to certain other states, it might be dangerous in terms of geopolitics. And the last point we wanted to raise is that when we're discussing um, these things sometimes, and especially as uh, fetishist international lawyers, we tend to see states. We don't tend to see you know, what is happening within states, the gender issue. 
uh, was raised uh, earlier this morning, and I, we think it's really, really important. But other issues about how trade reconstitutes domestic relations of production is, is actually probably even more important than ha uh, what I have been uh, discussing so far. And for example, there's lots of criticism and spot on criticism about, for example, how TPP is dismantling lots of the flexibilities, again, developing states managed to get through the WTO in the trade-related aspects of um, uh, IP, of in intellectual property, especially when it comes to medicines, and India having compulsory license, licensing to certain medicines that are essential for its population, and we can see that, for example, through TPP, these, uh, these flexibilities, these limited flexibilities that trade allowed uh, to developing states and especially to the most deprived uh, of the population of developing states seem to be washed off. And also, for example, when it comes to what seems to be the case, which is a total abolition of tariffs when it comes to agricultural products between um, the US and the EU, for example, in TTIP, that could definitely have implications for states like Ireland, for example, when it comes to agricultural production, but also when it comes to agricultural production in states of the global south, and agricultural production is particularly sensitive to trade fluctuations, that could have very big implications, and we can see that from cases that have already been adjudicated in the WTO, and I'm referring to the infamous banana saga, that you know, if you just look which states brought the claims, it might just seem a quarrel between <coughs> states of Central America, I guess states of the Caribbean. If you actually take a look closer, you will see, for example, that these Caribbean states that had this preferential treatment by the EU, Bananas were produced in relatively small plots with, and that takes us to the morning session, with many women who were head of households with all the social status this accorded to women. And even um, in those states that broke the claims, like Ecuador, etc., even those workers in bananas that were unionized, they were earning approximately one third of the income the equivalent Caribbean producers were, um, were earning. So we can see with cases that have already been adjudicated, and you know, sometimes the legal form can be very obstructing. We might say, you know, that's a, pro that's a problem between Ecuador and Caribbean states. In reality, it was much more so a big, big multinational corporations, specific multinational corporations in that case, against small producers, women having some degree of control over production and therefore over their lives. Relatively, again, always relatively environmentally sustainable practices and so on and so forth. So I guess, you know, because with the TTIP um, conjecture is very difficult, it's very easy actually to forget that there's a world outside the US uh, and the EU, and uh, what I'm trying to say is that we need to always remember, and we need to always remember that what seems now scandalous is the the normal quote unquote for big for actually the vast majority of the world. So what seems scandalous to us, and what mobilizes even relatively centrist people in Europe. De uh, developing post-colonial states had to endure already since actually the moment they became quote-unquote independent. So that's definitely something uh, in, to broaden the discussion from TTIP to the way global trade is organized, global investment is organized, I think it should be a very welcome evolution. <laughs>